just want to start by saying again, thank you so much for being here today. If you happen to be here last week, or maybe you, maybe you saw something online, um, I shared with those who were here last week a, a, a message entitled, um, Thanks a Million. And part of it was born out of uh, the time that I had while I was in the hospital and the weeks and the weeks following that. I felt like God, uh, and I'm going to use a word, and I hope I, I, I'm reminded of the time I used the phrase, we're in a pickle, and there was a young, a young lad in the back uh, of the church that morning, and he said, we're in a pickle? Uh, we're not in a pickle. I mean, literally, we're not in a pickle. But I, f I felt like um, as I was there uh, laying in the hospital, I felt like God um, like imparted to me. I want to use the word impregnated me with these verses. And I don't mean that literally. I just mean they so got into my soul in such a way that I haven't been able to um, forget about them. And it was based upon uh, the verses found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. You, remember, you may remember we looked at them last week. Uh, one translation says it this way, always rejoice Pray at all times and give thanks no matter what happens, for this is the way God wants you who belong to Jesus Christ to live. I tried to simplify that for us and make it super simple by simply saying, always rejoice, always pray, and always give thanks, for this is the way God wants Christians to live. <laughs> yeah. <Amen>. So, <clears throat> as I was feeling impressed with that passage, um, I couldn't help but think about what I had talked to you about a couple of months ago, in, uh, as it re relates to the early church, right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two, and I. I felt like there must be some connection between what God was impressing upon my heart and what, what actually took place during those days after the Holy Spirit. And I, I went back and reread that, and I found this verse, or a couple of verses, it's the latter part of verse 46, and all of 47, it says, every day they continued to meet in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And if you were here last week, you'll know that we looked at some key words in that particular passage. We looked at the word glad and what that means. It means extremely joyful, like, like st completely stoked about what God was doing. We looked at the word sincere, and we found out that it meant that people were living offense-free. They didn't have stuff between and against one another. And then we looked at the word, the word favor there in the latter part of that verse, and it means to be, to be overflowing with thanksgiving. They were living out, those early believers were living out God's plan and purpose for them as Christ followers, revival was in the air, and it resulted in an atmosphere. Remember, the whole thing I've been touching on with you is, what was it that compelled the early church, and what, what was it that made them so attractive to the world around them? And one of the things that was contagious to the world around them was the atmosphere that was taking place among them. That is why I believe it goes on to say, and the Lord added to their number daily those being saved. Every day there were more people being attracted by what God was doing and the atmosphere that that was creating in the early church. Today I'd like to talk to you about three things that I believe are important as it relates to 
having a thankful heart. Number one, God is attracted to thankful hearts. Boy, it's really quiet in here this morning. God is attracted to thankful hearts. Towards the tail end of my thoughts with you last week, I said, if you want to attract the presence of God in your life, if you want to attract the presence of of God in your family's life, if you want to see your community experience the presence of God, be thankful. Be thankful. Have a thankful heart. Convey thankfulness to the people around you. Thank God. Thank people. Because thankful people are joyous people. Being thankful is more important than you might think. Next to Psalm 23, Psalm 100 is probably one of the most well-known psalms. Psalm 100 says this, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Now listen to this. Enter His gates. You know it. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I want you to notice in particular that phrase, enter his gates. The Hebrew word here in this particular verse means the gate or an entrance of a town or city. The word picture that's being presented to us in this moment is that God lives somewhere. God has a place that he calls his town, his city. And as you and I come to that, uh, to to the wall of that town, and we come to the gate of that town... You may remember as kids watching cartoons, there was this, uh, there was this, word, this word that got used, open sesame, right? In God's city, the, the password is thanksgiving. The password is thank you. The password is expressing thanks. If you want to get through the gate, into the place where God lives, be thankful. If you don't want to experience the presence of God, then don't be thankful. It's as simple as that. If you fail to be thankful, the door is not open to you of God's presence. His city, His place, His presence is available to anyone who would come but you must have a heart of thanksgiving. That's the first thing I want to convey to you this morning is God is attracted to thankful hearts. If you want to invite the presence of God into your life, be a thankful person. The second thing I want to convey to you this morning is that thankfulness begets joy. Thankfulness gives birth to joy. I want to take you to an Old Testament story to illustrate what I'm suggesting to you. It's found in the book of Nehemiah. Now, for those of you who may be a student of Scripture, you'll know that the, the book of Nehemiah is a classic study on leadership. Nehemiah was like an extraordinary great leader. It is the story about Israel's revival and reformation after spending many, many years in Babylonian captivity in an ungodly setting, in a place where uh, they found it difficult to worship the way they were familiar with. Nehemiah was God's appointed man uh, to help lead the resurrection and restoration of their capital city, Jerusalem. Everything had been destroyed. In their absence, the place that they had called home was utterly obliterated. 
Nehemiah was tapped by God to oversee specifically the building of the wall around the city. Now, if you know that story, there were many ups and downs in the, in the, in the uh, a task of rebuilding things. But if you get to the end of the book, you come to chapter 12, and, you, and you, now they, are, they have rebuilt the wall, the city is well underway of being restored, and they get to this point in chapter 12 where it's time now to dedicate the work that has been done. A celebration service. And we find in verse 31 of chapter, well, of chapter 12 that Nehemiah assembles two large choirs. He gets together the Levites, and it tells us other people from other surrounding towns, and he puts together two choirs for one purpose. I read it to you now, verse 31, I assign two large choirs to give thanks. They got one job, give thanks. Two large choirs, one at the northern end of the wall and one at the south end of the wall. The dedication event happened in a certain way, in a way that God had called them to do it. And it started by assembling two choirs, large volumes of people, for one mission to give thanks to God. Now I want you to notice, remember, the point that I'm making to you right now is that thanksgiving gives birth to joy. Listen to what it says in verse 43. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices of rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away from the city. So it started, it started with two choirs with the assignment of all you're, all, you're, all you're called to do is just simply give thanks to God. And in that giving of thanks, it created a spirit of joy and rejoicing in the city that I want you to notice what I just read to you. I thought it interesting. It, 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 it says the men, or I'm sorry, the women and children also rejoiced. What that tells me is that the men were rejoicing also. Their thanksgiving led to joy, great joy. I think sometimes in our culture, we have it backwards. We wait for something to happen in our life that, get, that brings some joy to us, then we say thank you. The Bible has that the other way around. You start by giving thanks, and then joy ensues. You start by putting together some choirs on the inside of you. You begin to give thanks to God, and then joy comes. Got it? Third thing I want to convey to you is, like Nehemiah, we must have a thanksgiving plan. If we must have a life plan to grow in gratitude or it will not happen. Listen, growing in gratitude will not happen through acquiring more stuff. If it were about more stuff coming to us, our culture would be awash in gratitude, but it's not. Gratitude begins and grows as we become more aware of God's presence and particularly of his goodness. Growing in Jesus-shaped gratitude has everything to do with how we see things our view of things, our worldview, how we're looking at life around us, your perception of things. 
Now, as you leave here today, you can try to psych yourself up to be better at being thankful. But uh, but I believe you'll find that it will last about as long as you remember this sermon. But if you ask God to help you see things from his perspective, Lord, help me to see what you see. Help me to hear what you hear. You will end up growing in gratitude. Gratitude or thanksgiving is the natural byproduct, uh, is the natural byproduct of seeing things the way God sees them. I, I wasn't, I don't have this in my notes, but on the eve of Jesus dying for our sins, and as he's celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus, in spite of what was looming, in spite of where, where he knew he was headed, it tells us that at, at that meal, he looked toward heaven and gave thanks. It has to do with your perception of things. Now, thanksgiving and gratitude is, or can be defined as, the perception of that which is good. I think I have it here for you on the screen. You might want to write that down. That's a helpful one right there. Thanksgiving or gratitude is the perception of the good. It's about your ability and my ability to perceive the good. Are you there? Now, <clears throat> there are factors involved with this. And that's what I want to spend the rest of, the time, of my time talking to you about this morning. There are some, some, some things we need to understand about shaping our, our understanding. I, you've probably heard it said before that people see the glass half full or see the glass half empty. Maybe you've heard that. What we're really trying, when we use that kind of idiom, uh, what we're really talking about is how people perceive things around them. You know, are they looking at things through a, a negative lens? Are they looking at things through a positive lens, right? That's what we're really talking about. It's all about your perception, and particularly thanksgiving and gratitude is about your perception of that which is good. Three factors. They all start with the same four letters. It's a little, a little Latin word. You've heard it before. It's the word Benny. B-E-N-E. -E. Literally translated means good. Benny. A truly thankful heart involves three Bennies. You know, when people go to get a job and things like that, they're, they're looking for the Bennies, right? What are the Bennies? What is the good that you're offering me? Right? You've heard of that, right? The first one has to do with benefit. Benefit. B-E-N-E-F-I-T. Benefit. A great way to remember what this word benefit means is simply by remembering the word Benny means good, and then this little last three letters, good fit. It's a good fit for me, right? Benefits. I must, if I am to tr have a heart that's growing in gratitude and thanksgiving, I must understand that there are benefits. There are things that, that uh, I don't want to uh, burn all my powder right here, but there are things that God has for you. Benefits. 
You must believe that it's a good thing for you to receive benefits. If you're of such a person that says, well, I, 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 I don't really want anything, I don't need anything, I don't deserve anything. I, you know, if you're, if you're that person, then when stuff, God puts stuff in your life, he sends things your way, you won't see them for what they are because you, are, you have a hard time receiving. You must understand that God has benefits. Psalm 103 verses 1 through 4 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Things that are meant to be good fits for me. Things like, he goes on to say, he forgives your sins. Now that's, that's a good thing. That's a benefit. You know why? Because we sin. That's a good fit for me that somebody is willing to forgive my sins. Because I sin. He goes on to say, who heals your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God has benefits. We must, if we are to grow in thankfulness, if we are to grow in gratitude, we must believe and understand that God has benefits for us. If you live your life and you think that, 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 that you're the source of all your benefits, then you, then you will not be growing in gratitude. You won't grow. You will be, you, well, enough. We'll get to the next one. All right. Secondly, another Benny word. It has to do with the word benefactor. Benefactor. Now, a good way to remember this word is you, as you look at that word, I think you, okay, it's on the screen. As you look at the word right there, you might see minus one letter, you might see a word at the, at the tail end of that. Factory, right? Factory. Now, what do factories do? They produce things, right? That's what factories are there for. They produce a product. Benefactor means one who does or produces good. That's what, literally what it means. One who does or produces good. Good factory. Good producer. Good uh, doer. That, that kind of thing when you talk about benefactor. To be grateful and grow in thankfulness, you must believe that the benefits that come to us do not happen by accident. They're not some kind of random, uh, you know, uh, thing that this takes place. They come from somebody. You and I must believe that we have a benefactor with good intentions towards us. If I'm to be a thankful person in the way the Bible portrays it, then I must believe that God is my great benefactor. He is, the, he is if you will, like a factory producing good stuff for me all the time. You must believe that. The writers of the Bible were convinced that God was their great benefactor. One such verse that illustrates this is James chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul, James writes and says, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. We have a great benefactor. 
If you are to grow in gratefulness, this must be your perception of things. First of all, that there are benefits in God for you. You must believe that. If you are to grow in thankfulness and gratefulness, you must believe that. You must believe also that God is your great benefactor. That he is the one who is good, producing good for you. The third element also starts with the word Benny. We have benefit, we have benefactor, and now the last one, the beneficiary. Beneficiary means the one who receives the good. That's you. That's me. You are the beneficiary of the benefits of a God who has your best interests at heart. Now, in a biblical worldview, this is really important. Please pay attention. In a, having a biblical worldview requires us to, to see something that is vital as it relates to us being the beneficiary. For there to be genuine thankfulness and gratitude, the beneficiary must believe that they are receiving something they did not earn, merit, or deserve. If, you, if I or you believe that I am owed something, it is much more difficult to be thankful for it. Hello? I will not be thankful as I should be thankful because there is a sense of entitlement. The sinful human race is naturally entitled. Look around. Look around. That's all you got to do. I, I, I dare say that's how this whole brokenness and fallenness thing started. Satan was able to convince mankind that they were entitled to something they weren't entitled to. And because they thought they were entitled to it, they just went and took from it anyways. The more we think we're entitled to, the less we are grateful for. We wonder, we ask ourselves, why do people who keep getting more and more show less and less gratitude? The bigger our sense of entitlement, the smaller our sense of gratitude. It's as simple as that. If we wonder where our culture is at right now, I am hitting on a main thing. Your mind, my mind, can convince me that I'm entitled to anything I want. And if I didn't get something I want, a lot of times what ends up happening is we blame other people because they must be getting in the way. In a Christian worldview, being thankless is not a psychological problem. It's not a lack of having a healthy emotional life. The Bible clearly says to us, it's a sin. Not having a thankful heart is a sin. Not having a thankful heart is a sin. Listen to what Paul says. He's describing people who are living a life opposed to God. Listen to what he says. For although they knew God, did you hear what I just said? 
for although they knew God. This isn't about atheists right now. This isn't about people who don't think God exists. If you read the verses before this verse, you find out that people had discovered from what they can see that there was a God. So Paul says in this verse, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. The people that Paul is describing here in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 are people who see themselves as entitled. It wasn't that they didn't believe in the existence of God. It was that they didn't see him as their great benefactor. They didn't see themselves as grateful beneficiaries of his amazing grace and undeserved favor. I want you to notice something. In this state of not giving glory to God or credit to God, if I can say it that way, nor giving thanks to him, it says their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Can I just say it to you this way? Thanklessness leads to a bad state of things. The Bible uses various words to talk about thanklessness. The ungrateful heart, you aren't going to like this, so buckle up. The ungrateful heart, when it speaks, it comes forth as grumbling and complaining. The unthankful heart comes forth in grumbling and complaining. Paul says that grumbling and complaining is the normal mindset of people who are not in tune with God. When Paul heard about a spirit of grumble and complaint in the church at Corinth, can you imagine that? Church people grumbling and complaining. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine that. Church people. But Paul heard about it. He said there were some people over there grumbling and complaining. Do you know, can I just say this? I'm going to get out from behind there to say this. If you want to extinguish the move of God quicker than anything, quicker than abhorrent sin, just start grumbling and complaining. God will move on. He will move on. He will say that those are people who are living a life that neither gave thanks. I've seen, we've seen over the years, Jody and I have seen, all you have to do to cancel out a move of God is just get a church fight started. It's over, Rover. Did you hear what I just said? That's all you got to do. Just get some division going, some grumbling and complaining. Whatever revival train you were on, it's over. You know why? Why? Because God's attracted to thankfulness. He's repelled by grumbling and complaining. That's for my life personally, but it's for a church as well. The, <clears throat> we've watched churches. God does a little something in an area, and a church goes from 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 people, 200 people. It's growing. Things are good. There's movement happening. People are full of thanks, full of joy, whatnot. Somebody comes along, gets a little grumbling and complaining started, and all of a sudden the church goes from what it was back. It's, you know, if you haven't watched it happen before, it's sad when it does. Remember, my whole premise to you is, is what, how is it that God, how, how is it that revival commences and can be maintained? And I'm suggesting to you a, an incredibly key component, component to that is, a, is hearts of thanksgiving. 
just continually thanking God. Thank you, Lord. Thanksgiving leads to joy. Woohoo! Yay! Look what God is doing, right? If you want to extinguish that, if you want to put the <laughs> to that, all you got to do is start complaining. That's all you got to do. I'm giving you, I'm giving some good advice about how to extinguish the move of God in your life personally, the move of God in a church, a move of God in a country. Why are we having such a time getting revival going nationwide? It's because we've got a bunch of entitled people who aren't thankful for anything. That's the problem. If people start to become thankful for how God's blessed them, you'll see revival happen. You will. And it has to start with us. It's us stopping murmuring and complaining and grumbling. I told you, you wouldn't like it. So Paul says, he says, listen, I heard this church that he given birth to, right? And revival, it broke out in Corinth. Things were going great. Then he gets word, he gets word, there's some some, uh, complaining going on. He said, I got to write a letter. Because there's nothing that's going to extinguish the move of God quicker than that, right? So he writes him a letter. And he decides to remind them of a story of the Israelites. And now you remember, he's writing to a Gentile church. People are not familiar, uh, like, like Jewish people would be of their history. He's reminding them of something that happened among the Israelites as God was leading them. Now, here's the really the, the, the thing you need to grab hold of. God was the great benefactor of Israel. Still is, that's right. God was the great benefactor of Israel. He gave them freedom. Do you know the story? Okay. He gave them freedom. He took care of them, fed them, you know, what was it? Uh, uh, woke up in the morning, there were frosted flakes out there, right? And then just in the evening, all of a sudden there was uh, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A as far as you could see. Chick-fil-A and frosted flakes. How much better can it be than that, right? He's feeding them. Remember, prior to that, all they had was leek soup. That's what they had. They had leek soup. And now they've got Frosted Flakes and Chick-fil-A. Come on, that's awesome. Nope. What'd they do? Complain. Complain. Morning, every morning, all we have is Frosted Flakes. Every night, all we have is Chick-fil-A. They were so, they were so... I don't know, this sense of entitlement had somehow gripped them in such a way that their, remember what it says, their, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darker. You know how dark their hearts got? Their hearts got so dark that they're thinking they had it better back in Egypt. How crazy is that? Leek soup, frosted flakes, Chick-fil-A. And you're thinking we want to go back to the leek soup? What are you, nuts? Yeah, your foolish hearts have become darkened. You're not thinking straight. That's what that means. You're not thinking straight. You've lost sight of your great benefactor. You've lost sight of the good. Hello? I, I know I got the right crowd. So, so, so God does all this great stuff. He gives, them, he gives them awesome precepts to live by. We call them the Ten Commandments. He says, listen, you do, it. You do life this way, it's going to be good for you. Right? He gives, them, he gives them that. He takes them to a promised land. He takes them to this place. Remember the guys that went out? I think Pastor Josh, you talked about it a couple weeks ago. Somebody did just recently. You or Chris or somebody. You know, he, they go in. 
They go in, it sends the 12 spies into the promised land. Right? They come back out. Now, the phrase that gets used, 10 of them, it says, had a bad report. It wasn't that there wasn't great stuff in the promised land. The problem was their perception of things. You got it? Oh, 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 oh. and you know what it says? Do, yeah, they're like, oh, we, there's no way we can take the promise. We can't go in there and do that. So are the grapes big? Oh, man, they're so huge, you can't believe how big they are. Is there lots of honey? Oh, honey everywhere, milk and all this great stuff. Well, we can't do that. We can't do it. And you know what it says about that? You know what it says? They started to spread a bad report. Can I make that, can I bring that right down to our, our, our vernacular? They started complaining. And that complaining spread to other people. And you know what God did? He said, fine, you ain't going in. You ain't thankful? Remember the gate? Remember the gate? How do we get through the gate? We get there through Thanksgiving. You're not thankful? Doors closed to you. No promised land for you. Whole generation had to die. Hello? You got it? Anyways, Paul's writing this letter, and he says, uh, this is, uh, uh, I don't know, if I was writing a letter, if I as your pastor was writing a letter to somebody, and I wrote this verse, I'd probably get fired. Okay, I probably get fired. So he writes to Corinthians chapter ten, verse ten, and he says this: "Do not grumble, as some of them did, speaking to the Israelites, and were killed by a destroying angel." How'd you like to read that letter? Uh, yeah, okay. Pastor, did you really write that? Pastor Paul did. Our natural tendency is to grumble and complain. Anybody? You're lying if you're not raising your hand. You, you are flat out lying. Some of you, some of you, some of you right now are probably grumbling and complaining about what I'm talking about. The fact that I'm talking about grumbling and complaining, right? You may not be saying it out loud right now, but you're thinking it in your soul, right? Like, dude, can this guy talk about something else? You won't have to go far along in this day before you hear a political headline or a, something from our culture and whatnot, and it will just naturally, it will just naturally want to pull up some grumbling and complaining. It's just in there. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're pre-programmed to be that way, our fallen nature. So my, my, my thought, and this is the thing the Lord's been impressing upon me lately, is we talk about spiritual warfare all the time, right? We go, oh, we got a battle. How about we come up with a strategy to combat thanklessness? How about we come up with a life plan so that there is less of that coming out of my mouth and more thanksgiving coming out of my mouth? If you don't put a plan together, do you know what your default is? You will be complaining. That's what you're going to do. If you don't come up with something else to, to, to combat that, to change that, that's where you will head. That's where you go. So I have a suggestion. You don't have to do this. You can continue to, uh, to uh, um, you know, find it a challenge to enjoy the presence of God. You can do whatever, but I have a suggestion for you. Now, and I'm almost done, all right? For those of you who are watching your watch right now, okay? Why don't you take a sheet of paper, just a plain old sheet of paper, 
And why don't you put a, a, a thing at the top that says, things I am thankful for. Right here on the top. Right at the top of the sheet. Then right underneath that, as a good reminder to you, that God is your great benefactor. Don't forget that. And then I would suggest that maybe you make three columns of people, places, and possessions that you are thankful for. Real simple. Not hard to do at all. Can you all see this? Oh, it's on the screen. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Awesome. I didn't, didn't know I had a slide for that. That's awesome. All right. Oh, very good. Reading my mind. Nice. Now, <laughs> yeah, okay. Things you are thankful for. Stuff, people, places you're thankful for. This is, remember, I'm talking about a strategy to nip our complaining in the bud. Now, I'd like to say to you that that's all you got to do. All you have to do is just write some stuff down, and as your list grows, you know, you're just going to become this factory of thanksgiving. I, th I think this is a good place to start. But if you want something to change in you, to, to, to switch over, remember last week? Remember last week, and this is the part I got to tell you again. Last week, I said to you, when I got home from the hospital, I told my wife to go out to Arcade and buy all the thank you cards she could find. You know, just get a bunch of them. I need a bunch of them. And <clears throat> I want to say, suggest to you this morning that if you want to take this and have it become imparted to you, like it becomes something in your soul, take, you don't have to go out and buy all the cards. I don't want, well, Go out and buy them if you want, but take a sheet of paper and write a letter to somebody. Get a card, write a little something, something to them, because in you taking the action to do that, it starts to write it on your soul. If you just think it, it will go in and out, and that will, oh, that's nice, that's great, wonderful. But when you start to write it down, when I started to write some of the stuff that I wrote down, I began to relive a moment. And it began to, it began to do something in my soul. Just, write, just writing a little note, a thank you note. Now you say, okay, well, if I'm thankful for a place, then who am I supposed to write to? Well, my experience is, is that a lot of times places were, were things that we encountered that, that somebody made us aware of. Do you, know, do you understand what I mean? Like, uh, like a good restaurant. Like, you know, you go there and you, wow, that was really, really good. But somebody made you aware of that probably, or I don't know, thank Google. I don't, I don't it doesn't matter, it, you know, whatever. Or maybe the things, the possessions that you consider are of value to you. Maybe, I don't know, write a letter to God. Write a letter to God. And say, hey, thanks. We have got to find ways in the climate that you and I live in, in the in the times that we find ourselves living in, we have got to find a way to combat the half-empty glass world that we live in. And God's teaching me ways 
of not just giving thanks, but becoming a more thankful person. Recognizing my great benefactor and realizing that he has sent some really good things my way. And acknowledging that and doing something about it. Rather than living with an entitled heart and an entitled mindset. That's not going to do us any good personally and uh, corporately. It won't help us get where God wants to take us either. I'm done. Would you stand as we... Okay, Heidi, did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, this is for those of you who don't know, Heidi's my daughter. And I hate to say this, but if she wants to say something, she can. Okay, go ahead. So I just wanted to give a personal um, testimony to this. Um, several years ago, I found myself in a, an extremely dark valley um, of depression and anxiety. And I had read this book, 1,000 Gifts by Ann Voskamp. Um, and uh, in that book, she encourages people to journal out all the things that they're thankful for. But I found a little snippet. If you don't mind, I'm going to read it out of that book. So the, the root word of Eucharisteo is charis, meaning grace. Jesus took the bread and saw it as grace and gave thanks. He took the bread and knew it to be gift and gave thanks. But there is more, and I read it. Eucharisteo, thanksgiving, envelops the Greek word of grace, charis. But it also holds its derivative, the Greek word shara, meaning joy. Joy, <laughs> Uh, yes, I might be needing some of that. That might be what the quest for more is all about, that which Augustine claimed without exception, all try their hardest to reach the same goal, that is joy. I breathe deep like a sojourner finally coming home. That has always been the goal of the fullest life, joy, and my life knew exactly how elusive that slippery three-letter word joy can be. I think of it then again, that night of nightmares, the flailing, fran frantic, moon-eyed lunch for more. What more what? And this was it. I could tell how my whole being responded to that one word. I longed for more life, for more holy joy. That's what I was struggling out of nightmares to reach, to seize joy. But where can I seize this holy grail of joy? I look back down to the page. Was this the clue of the quest of all the most important? Deep chara joy is found only at the table of the Eucharistio, the table of thanksgiving. I sit there long wondering, is it that simple? Is the height of my chara joy dependent on the depths of my Eucharistio thanks? So then as long as thanks is possible, I think this through. As long as thanks is possible, then joy is always possible. Joy is always possible whenever meaning now wherever. And so I just want to encourage you that when you are in the darkest valleys, when you can't see light at the end of the tunnel, and you feel like there's no end to it, one of the biggest things that pulled me out of that was um, writing down the things and shifting my focus from my problems and my suffering to the things that, ha that the Lord has been always faithful in and being thankful for. So... Thank you, Heidi. Would you stand as we pray? I guess I want to leave you with this question today. Do you want to be part of the choir? I want... I want the joy that takes place in this place to be heard a long way off. I want people to know they can come here and find what their heart longs for. But for that to happen, as I was looking at things, we have to find ourselves being part of the choir that simply all we do is say, thank you, God. Lord, I thank you. Heidi, just when she read that, it's like, could it be that simple? Could it be that simple? 
that the problems of this world, the problems we encounter personally, that we, that we would find our way into your presence in dealing with all that simply by being part of that choir that says, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying that as we go forth from this place and we'll have plenty of opportunity to be other than thankful, I pray that you would, by a work of your spirit, you would bring us up short. When we find ourselves complaining about our spouse, complaining about our children, children complaining about their parents, church people complaining about church, Lord, bring us up short. Bring us up short, Lord. We don't want to do anything to interrupt your presence. We don't want our heart, uh, the gates of our heart, Lord, to be closed because we're approaching you in a way that's not favorable to you. Lord, we want to enter your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Teach us and train us to be a thankful people. In Jesus' name, amen.